So, Joe, why don't you tell me what you had for breakfast? Je ne mange pas le petit déjeuner. Non, croissant. Um, je préfère être uh, uh, léger. Okay. Et léger, c'est good. I had a I had the German style breakfast piece of bread with ce ne, ce cheese. So, which is very much not 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 the not the French uh, French. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Hey everyone, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. Today we have a special episode for you as we bring you our conversation with Joe Lubin. I recorded this interview with my colleague, Federike Ernst, at the Ethereum Community Conference in Paris, which took place in early March. Now, it had been over a year since we last had Joe on the podcast. You can check out that interview here. It was a good opportunity to check in and see how he's doing. I've always enjoyed talking to Joe because he's a really down-to-earth guy and he's always got some interesting insights. So we discussed a number of things, including the consensus reorganization, or as he puts it, the continual consensus reorganization. We discussed his vision for interoperability between public and permission blockchains. We talked about the prospects of governments and central banks leveraging Ethereum to issue stable coins. And of course, Ethereum 2.0 and the challenges ahead. Now, keep in mind that we recorded this interview in early March and that a lot has happened since then. The world is a very different place now than it was three weeks ago. And this got me thinking, like many of you, I'm sure, about how the crypto community is dealing with all of this. And so I'd like to organize an event where we can come together and talk about these issues. My goal here is pretty simple. I want to create a space where people from different communities within crypto can come together, leave their ideological differences at the door, and talk about these issues. So there's a lot of things I think that need to be discussed. For one, how teams are dealing with confinement. Of course, Remote work is pretty widespread in our industry, but I think this crisis is forcing teams to think about new innovative ways to collaborate. The other thing on a lot of people's minds is some of these assumptions that are being tested at the moment and the correlation between crypto and traditional finance. And also, I think it's the right time to talk about monetary policy, both in crypto, but also in the broader economic context. Governments around the world are implementing massive stimulus measures that are going to have lasting effects on startups and on our industry. So we're still in the very early stages of planning this, but I did want to mention it here to gauge the interest. So we set up a website where you can leave your email address and we'll keep you informed as things developed. The link to that website is in the show notes, but I'll mention it here. It's epicenter.rocks slash reset everything. And with that, here's your interview with Joe Lubin. I love that we're starting this off in French because uh, you know we're here at HCC, and so uh, it's it's and it's so I can't and I can't speak French, which and, is, and a, which is a, which it is, immediately is, makes this a, a challenging interview. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks in, for having in me our, in, in, our in this uh, transparent uh, cage uh, for <laughs> for blockchain professionals uh, that also serves as a sauna. It also serves as a quarantine box against. Oh, yeah, uh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is lovely. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we last spoke to you, I think it was probably about a year ago, I want to say, yeah, was that, was that about it right? It feels longer than that. Yeah, I mean, Everything I, feels I, longer. Yeah, it must have been 18 months ago. Yeah, or? yeah. I mean, I, I feel like it was around January of 2019, so. Do you remember what we talked about? We, I do remember. Blo- blockchain, maybe? We did talk about blockchain. blockchain yeah. Um, so, yeah, give us a sense of, you know, how, how you think the ecosystem has evolved in a year, uh, what's your sort of takeaway on uh, on um, So on the development front, uh, I think the um, the growth, the innovation has been astonishing. Um, on the uh, sort of speculative financial front, um, it has pretty much continued in doldrums. Um, on the enterprise front, it has been just charging. It, it remains in exponential growth uh, as far as we can tell. So uh, on the development front, uh, they're, they're still uh, spectacularly talented people uh, building in the industry and being drawn into uh, the ecosystem. And with respect to scalability, privacy, confidentiality, uh, we're seeing, we have seen over the last 18 or so months, massive breakthroughs that uh, uh, are coming online. So whether it's uh, um, zero knowledge techniques for privacy and confidentiality, zero knowledge techniques for scalability um, in the form of optimistic rollups, ZK rollups, um, Starkware did uh, 
um, sort of experiment on mainnet where I think they uh, landed about 9,000 transactions per second throughput. Yeah, it's really um, impressive. It, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, we are working with a project called Scale Networks, uh, which is uh, an EVM compatible layer two network solution. Um, we have a uh, our, our commerce and decentralized finance team has a, a product and set of services called Activate that uh, is enabling us to both launch their token and facilitate uh, uh, some of the operation of their network. And so we can launch, we can still launch utility tokens. So um, there has been much interest in tokenized securities and we're seeing a little bit of traction there. Uh, we did a project called Mata Capital there. We're doing a, a handful of other projects with tokenized securities. Um, but we're still big fans of utility tokens. Uh, utility tokens would not be considered securities by um, securities regulators around the world in, in most places um, and have some sort of utility in the network. And um, we're able to help projects like Scale launch uh, because we have a, a deep understanding of, of the securities regulatory infrastructure around the world. So we can uh, help launch the token. We can ensure that there's usage of the token. Um, we can ensure that there's full life cycle um, monitoring, security monitoring uh, of the token. Uh, we have uh, another tool. Uh, our Pegasus engineering group has another tool called Orchestrate that uh, um, as we move into a world where we have these business networks and they're effectively merged with financial infrastructure because we're tokenizing everything, uh, Orchestrate can enable businesses that are operating on networks like, uh, like Scales Network uh, to manage gas and nonces and uh, cancel transactions when they're in flight and resubmit transactions and register smart contracts, et cetera. And so um, those kinds of breakthroughs are, are bringing the technology um, to life effectively. So, Cool. It was already pretty apparent from your answer that Consensus still has a lot of different projects, but Consensus is being um, reorganized to a certain extent. Um, can you talk about that? Yes, consensus from day one around five years ago has been in continual reorganization. Um, a lot of the organization has been smooth, organic, evolutionary. Um, we had two events where um, we essentially made bigger changes, and those events saw us uh, shedding um, from a little north of 10% in, in each case, um, job functions that effectively weren't core uh, to what we were as an organization. So uh, more recently, we, let, let me go back a little bit. Um, so consensus started about a year after the Ethereum project began. Um, it started with the, the, the vision and mission of continuing, expanding on that project. And we started because it was an immature technology and there was no ecosystem or developer tooling, et cetera. We were trying to build decentralized applications, but there was no infrastructure or developer tooling uh, to enable us to do that. And so uh, we gathered a, a whole lot of brilliant uh, entrepreneurs and technologists and uh, began to explore the solution space. Um, in exploring the solution space, we incubated, invested in, launched uh, way over 100 projects, uh, and many of those uh, have developed very significant traction, a uh, real product market fit. Many of those did not. We, we ran lots and lots of experiments in, in a pretty freewheeling uh, culture. Um, and we're at the stage where now uh, we have a bunch of projects that do have very significant traction. Uh, these are uh, Hyperledger Basu, the Pegasus uh, tools and products around that. Uh, it's Infura, it's Metamask, it's... Uh, um, Uport, it's Alitheo, um, and all of those essentially fall along what we're calling a, a core tech stack. Uh, so they are working increasingly closely together and, um, and we're building uh, effectively a, what we're calling a blockchain operating system out of those pieces. So um, in recognizing that there were some pieces that had lots of traction but didn't fit in our core tech stack and some pieces that did fit in our core tech stack over the last year we've really been um 
sort of separating into two major functional groups within consensus and will effectively become two companies, an investment company and a, a software company. Uh, and so um, in that process, we realized that we didn't need a massive marketing group and, and we had uh, the ability to streamline in various other ways. So there were certain regions that we weren't doing great in and uh, on the professional services consulting side, we, we made some significant adjustments. And so we're just uh, um, a much leaner, um, much more coherent and integrated software company. And the investment company is also re-architected to um, optimize our portfolio um, and make new investments. Cool. <clears throat> I'll ask about these two companies in a bit, um, but uh, just before that, so basically consensus has been hugely instrumental in, in growing the Ethereum ecosystem. And um, there recently was a discussion on Twitter where someone said, uh, Ethereum, is, so Ether is the consensus token. <laughs> um, in, in many ways, that's extremely flattering. How did you feel about that? Well, I didn't pay attention. I, I wasn't aware of that uh, Twitter discussion. Um, and in a sense, there's some truth to that, but uh, I, other than for operational needs, consensus has never really held ether. Um, we are certainly aligned with um, a, call it a strong monetary policy, um, and certainly aligned with uh, growing the value of the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, a strong ether uh, brings talent into our ecosystem, it brings attention into our ecosystem, it adds security to the protocol. Um, but um, very directly, it doesn't increase the enterprise value of consensus. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so the two companies you talked about earlier, so if I understand correctly, one of them is kind of the investment arm, and I don't really want to talk about that all that much, but tell us about the other company, the company that builds stuff. Um, so is, is, is there a token going to be associated with this? How are, the, how are all, of, all of these um, diverse, com uh, diverse projects in this uh, the core tech stack um, going to work together, and uh, what, are, what, what, what are the thinkings on that? Sure, so the core tech stack company is called Consensus. <laughs> And um, it is, uh, so internally we call it Software Co versus Invest Co. Um, and uh, Consensus is a unique organization in that um, it's pretty much the only company in the world that has a very sophisticated public mainnet solution that is full stack. And also we use the exact same code um, as a sophisticated private permissioned Ethereum solution when we stand up networks or enable others to, to use our tooling. Um, we, over the last year or so, as we get more and more integrated, and, and integrated means that our different teams are working very closely together uh, to create coherent documentation, uh, coherent and shared APIs for, for different uh, domains of focus, um, shared product roadmaps, shared go-to-market activities. Um, when we take uh, that uh, into uh, a discussion with a, a prospective customer, um, we can basically offer from a, a coherent and optimizable solution from the protocol layer uh, with Hyperledger Besu and, and Orchestrate and other tooling um, called Pegasus Plus that uh, uh, enables enterprises to have the comfort of support and um, tools around um, the core protocol element uh, to infrastructural elements. Uh, so that's Infura on mainnet, um, but it's also potentially Infura Direct uh, in a, a private permission system. So Pegasus and Infura can respond to um, some of the same API calls, soon probably all of the same a API calls. Um, we have developer tooling in the form of uh, security audit infrastructure uh, in the form of Truffle, which we work in extremely closely with um, still. Um, uh, Pegasus Orchestrate um, enables us to, or enables people to orchestrate their transactions, but also do real-time security monitoring um, very soon. And so that, that infrastructure layer is critically important. Then we have identity and reputation solutions. So decentralized identity, verifiable credentials. We we lead the Decentralized Identity Foundation and the verifi Verifiable Claims and Credentials Group of the W3C. Um, 
And there's MetaMask, the wallet, which works very nicely across public and private systems. Um, it's got a, a plugin system called Snaps that's enabling us to start addressing different protocols around the world. And, and we definitely have a, an increasingly active interledger strategy. Uh, and then at the application layer, we can do document management and all, all sorts of other applications, uh, including tokenization. So various different forms where issuing bonds and equities and um, municipal bonds and lot, lots of other things. And all of that we can do because going all the way back to the Ethereum token launch, we've done a tremendous amount of legal work uh, with securities regulators around the world. And we can navigate that space with confidence. And so we can deliver those solutions in a perfectly regulatorily compliant fashion. You, you, met, you talked about the, so the, the interchain aspect here. And I'd like to ask you where, sort of t taking a step back and seeing where this is going. I mean, um, there, there's a, there's a, pretty important professional services component to consensus, uh, but you're also building technologies that are operating on the public side. Um, moving you know, in the future, how, how do you see sort of the public uh, permissioned uh, 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 interactions playing out? Um, do you see permission chains moving more and more towards uh, public networks, or do you think that they'll remain sort of uh, in their walled gardens? I mean, like we're seeing things already in Cosmos um, where like, Already, we're starting to see uh, sort of public validators um, validating private blockchains or permission blockchains. How do you see that playing out in Ethereum? Yeah, the the bifurcation of our ecosystem into public permissionless and private permissioned was um, a sort of necessary uh, ramification or or uh, circumstance um, that was essentially natural and, and caused by you know, enterprises, what enterprises are and, and what they need to be conservative about and pay attention to. So we, we saw the same thing uh, with the with companies adopting web technologies where um, they wanted to use certain protocols, but uh, um, they needed to use them inside firewalls uh, in on internets until um, they became uh, private enough, confidential enough, scalable enough back then and secure enough. Um, and uh, so we're seeing the same thing. We, we fully expect that uh, the World Wide Web will become an increasingly decentralized World Wide Web, uh, where it will incorporate many decentralized protocols um, for trusted transactions um, on blockchain networks uh, de for decentralized storage and bandwidth and heavy compute and proof of location, uh, uh, decentralized identity, et cetera. Um, that's just starting to happen, I, I think. Uh, in the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is driving some of that activity. Um, we so first by using the exact same technology um, for uh, consortium networks like Comgo Network that we built or Covantis that that we're building. Um, enterprises can. Um, build out use cases in a private context and use the exact same technology, the same expertise to move towards the public permissionless network. We can also, when Ethereum is scalable, uh, private and confidential enough, we can lift these systems, these logical constructs, and drop them down on public mainnet, uh, if that makes sense. Do you think this will be restricted to businesses or do you think governance, uh, governments will also resort to the Ethereum public blockchain? Um, yeah, I, I absolutely believe that uh, the governments uh, will find utility on, on public blockchains. Um, so governments are, are sort of the platform on which businesses run um, and the whole world is filled with platform risk. Um, uh, so. You know, we, we've seen platform risk in, in building your solution on Facebook or on LinkedIn um, or on the Apple uh, store, et cetera. Um, and it would be great if we moved into a world where there was less pr platform risk uh, for startups, um, but also less platform risk for, for larger organizations. Um, um, as we move, so we've done a, a bunch of um, provenance, supply chain track and trace work. Uh, we have a, a group called Trium that is working with Proc Procter & Gamble to put uh, the provenance of materials and diapers in, and various other P&G products um, 
on the blockchain so that a, a consumer can scan a QR code and see where where the materials came from, all the processing steps, etc. Um, um, supply chain track and trace is going to be an incredibly important use case uh, for blockchain, and, and it's going to be especially valuable to have that on on public mainnet that so that it can't be improperly manipulated um, but also as we move into a world where we have different kinds of conflicts like trade conflicts um, having uh, an infrastructure that is sufficiently decentralized so that even nation states can trust that nobody's able to improperly manipulate it will enable us to um, take our supply chains which are currently massively interleaved and as long as we have uh, say signatures, um, identity for devices. Um, as long as we have good data coming into blockchain systems, then um, these systems are, are going to be able to keep that data fairly clean. And so uh, when we do have conflicts, um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, still continue to trust our, our interleaved supply chain networks. Cool. Um, so when I alluded to governments uh, earlier, I mean basically what uh, uh, what governments do is they issue currency. So do you think they? So do you think governments will use the will use Ethereum as a base layer to uh, issue you know central bank issued uh, currencies? So I, when I, euro I, die, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's happening. Um, so I. I think most governments will move to a central bank digital currency. It's just a natural evolution of, of uh, um, you know, bringing technology to um, money systems. Um, I do believe that uh, central banks will use um, similar cryptographic primitives um, that are used in blockchain systems. I think very few of them actually need a blockchain system in order to implement a central bank digital currency. Um, I am hopeful that some of them will be interested in um, introducing privacy of your uh, financial assets and confidentiality with respect to your transactions um, to the monetary systems of, of their nation states. So I think there will be some countries in the world that, uh, that value that. I, I do think that um, probably the world will put, will put pressure on those governments or central banks so that uh, they'll say, okay, you can have your, your citizenry uh, appreciates privacy and confidentiality and free markets and stuff like that. And so uh, we will be comfortable if, you know, holdings under a certain size or transactions under a certain amount can be um, perfectly confidential or private. Um, uh, there, there are certainly other countries that, uh, uh, will continue to use technology uh, as a surveillance tool, and uh, they, they don't need blockchain to to do a really good job on that. Um, so, so do you think that so, so some countries will sort of uh, position themselves as uh, as many do now as sort of fiscal paradise, right? Like where. Um, but you know, moving moving towards the future, you'll have so digital currencies that preserve privacy and this sort of thing, and others that have like maybe more KYC, less privacy and this sure. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So we're just talking about nation state issued money, um, and uh, technology is moving so fast. It's you know, people are going to be able to do um, very impressive things uh, that enable um, real privacy and confidentiality on on these networks. Um, but with respect to nation state currency, uh, I think there will be some countries that distinguish themselves. Uh, so Christian Carlo, formerly uh, of the CFTC, um, has been, so he's driving thought leadership around central bank digital currencies. And, and he feels like the United States, um, uh, to the extent that it upholds uh, um, principles uh, of freedom and privacy uh, and free markets, etc., um, is a place where, because of rule of law and because of how things are constructed um, with respect to the Constitution and the law in the United States, it may be a place that creates a a really good version of a central bank digital currency. Uh, it may be a place where uh, you know certain protections will apply. Um, Always the optimist. <laughs> well, yeah. So I, well, I, I, ju I just think it's really interesting because 
when he mentioned that to me, I was like, yeah, maybe America could create something that's pretty good. It, it's not going to be um, what crypto anarchists appreciate uh, of uh, what can be built uh, on these networks. But uh, no, um, I, I think there are lots. So we should have choice. We should have op optionality in our monetary systems and our payment systems. Uh, and central bank or you know, nation states and central banks um, have certain responsibilities and, and they have the right to issue their own tokens, basically. And they have the right to create the rules around those tokens and their citizenry should um, work with their leadership and take a look at the what's available in the different technologies and, and make their best choice. And, you know, some nation states will make choices that I wouldn't make, uh, but that they're free to do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. I, I think uh, um, despite the fact that people always, well, some people sometimes uh, peg the U.S. as, as the surveillance state, I mean, inherently it's, it, is, it is a nation state that values privacy um, a lot more than other countries. So, for instance, in the European Union, in some countries, you you can't um, transact. You're not allowed to do transactions over a thousand euros uh, in 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 cash. And in America, of course, that that's completely fine. So, uh, yeah, I would I would tend to agree. We'll we'll see how it goes. And uh, nation states, especially ones as big as America, are just so many different factions, so many competing interests, and uh, we'll, we'll see what ends up winning out. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, the evolving states of Ethereum. Um, and, you know, by that, I mean sort of the evolving narratives in the space. And uh, I, I think, you know, every time we have one of these conversations, that narrative uh, maybe shifts a little bit. So, you know, I, I, at the very beginning, there was this idea of the world computer. And then um, from that, uh, there was a period where Ethereum was sort of the, you know, the, the funding machine. So it didn't start with the world computer. What did it start with? Um, so Vitalik wrote the white paper um, because he was working with some different projects. And uh, way back then, seven, even eight years ago, um, people were interested in creating their own cryptocurrencies. And so uh, one way to do that would be to take the Bitcoin code base and fork it and change a parameter or two uh, and make Litecoin or, or something along those lines. And despite the fact that that sounds really quick and easy, um, it would take a month or several months to to just do that little thing. Um, and that doesn't even include setting up a whole ecosystem and incentivizing people to, to care about this thing that, that you care about. And so Vitalik's initial interest was build something that was general enough so that somebody could start their own cryptocurrency uh, on the same platform and, and benefit from the the already built infrastructure. Right. OK. I mean, OK. So I'm, I'm taking shortcuts here. Uh, but um, I mean, we, we've we've gotten to a point now where uh, uh, DeFi is is sort of the uh, prevailing narrative in the space. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on sort of like, you know, what what kind of what kind of what, what is the future narrative uh, in in Ethereum? Like, what where does where does it go from here essentially? So I think all the narratives are valid simultaneously. Um, so Vitalik's initial narrative is still very valid. We create lots of digital assets, um, whether they're sort of cryptocurrency-like or um, equities or bonds or utility tokens or, or identity. Um, and so um, certainly the world computer narrative uh, is an interesting one. Um, I think the world computer is going to be something called the World Wide Web. Um, and it'll get increasingly decentralized as we incorporate more of these protocols. We, uh, for the web, we um, had a couple decades of um, Internet of Information protocols, so you know, free-to-use protocols uh, where the information was in infinitely copyable um, and um, you know, cheap. Uh, and now we have new protocols where the information shouldn't necessarily be infinitely copyable. And some of this information is actually quite valuable. And now we, we've got a few decades ahead of us to explore those different protocols. Um, and so the narrative that I see is a much bigger narrative. It's, uh, um, it's essentially building out the global or re-architecting the global economy on 
a base trust foundation, which needs to be maximally decentralized or will be corrupted by patient, well-resourced actors. Um, on that, we need a financial plumbing layer. And a lot of those early uh, internet magic money Lego DeFi protocols are being built on Ethereum. There, there's some being built in other places and, and even Bitcoin is being wrapped in, in moved over to Ethereum to, to participate in the, uh, the open decentralized finance ecosystem. So all of that um, represents financial plumbing um, that, in, that includes insurance and prediction markets and decentralized exchanges and um, certain kinds of lending approaches, over collateralized, under collateralized flash, et cetera. Um, and, you know, um, automated portfolio management. So, so many of these these different protocols can now be snapped together or wired together uh, into a, a financial infrastructure that will be usable by banks and central banks, um, but also these same tools will be usable um, to people. Uh, and so it's very similar to the, the web revolution where publishing was suddenly usable um, by normal people and, and whole industries built up around that. And so we've got base a new base trust foundation and a new financial infrastructure for the planet that we can all participate in and that we can all carry around in our pocket effectively that we can all program. And on top of that, the, the world uh, companies and governments uh, can re-architect their systems on, on a, a better set of foundations. Okay, if, so it's money if, Legos if, for everyone. If we're, so it, no, it's not money Legos. So money Legos represents an enabling layer, an enabling financial layer. It's not about building the financial layer. Um, you know, the, the world probably didn't set out to build the financial system. Um, the world set out to, you know, um, make food and make shelter and make transportation and make clothing, etc. cetera. And uh, you need financial plumbing in order to efficiently get all that done. Uh, and so what we're building right now is, I, I think, the financial plumbing and um, all of the industries, uh, the existing ones and novel industry uh, that we probably can't um, quite fathom yet will be able to re-architect or architect themselves on that platform. Mm. I mean, we didn't set out to build the financial system yet, yet we did. Uh, with yeah. with all well, of its well, it's necessary and yeah and well, it's with all of its flaws and, uh, sure. and, and, and you know, all of its advantages pretty, also yeah it's also pretty remarkable it's also pretty remarkable yes uh, but um, you know given given that uh, you know Ethereum smart contracts DeFi allows anyone with uh, you know the ability to code and soon the ability to drag and drop. Uh, things in a browser to, to, to create a no, a... no code is getting really interesting. No code is getting interesting, indeed. Um, since since DeFi enables anyone with a computer to create a financial instrument and to, and to, to make that available to the world, um, you know, what are some of the perverse aspects that you, that you think uh, we need to be mindful of and perhaps you know, not to replicate or even worsen some of the uh, perverse aspects of the existing financial system? Um, so I'm not going to harp on perverse aspects. Um, I, I think the way that I view that always the uh, optimist. My, well, my perspective <laughs> is that um, yeah, it's going to be the wild west. It's going to be crazy wonderful. Um, and you know, whether it's uh, there, there have been so many eras of new technology. I would call you know banks and safes and stagecoaches that transported money a, a new technology and. Every new era has its builders um, and its breakers. Uh, it's uh, its consultants, its self-appointed consultants that see a system, that see value there, that see vulnerabilities there, uh, and that uh, essentially extract its fees um, in order for pointing out how the system can be a little bit better. And so, um, this, you know, the open programmable uh, financial system which enables people programmers to touch the financial rails the live financial rails um directly uh, program value tokens that move along those rails directly uh there are going to be a lot of pitfalls there um uh, but it's also um when we get a hold of it uh when we uh prudently build it out in uh, probably layers uh it's going to be incredibly empowering of, of um, 
virtually everything in society. So um, if I were forced to make recommendations, I would recommend to all the different groups that are building out financial protocols uh, to go slowly, um, to move as prudently as possible, to recognize that because they're in a composable synergistic ecosystem, anything that they do um, potentially affects everything else. So even if you formally verify security audit, um, the logic and the contract and, and the byte codes, um, you're still potentially going to make a change uh, in your little system, in your little Lego block um, that represents a tool or a vulnerability uh, that somebody can exploit in, in some other part of the system. And so we're going to need to get everybody together to, to take a, a systematic or systemic um, view on how, how all this works together. And um, I, I, think, I think that ecosystem is realizing that it needs to move slowly. If you had to venture a guess right now, uh, what the most surprising thing that will happen in the ecosystem in 2020 is, um, what would your guess be? Most exciting thing that will happen in Surpri 20 years. So, surprising. So first, first, oh, okay. First, first, let me just continue or finish off what I was saying. Um, we're already making progress in that direction. Um, so with the, the token launch boom and ICOs, uh, we started a project called TrueSet and Masari started up to, to basically crowdsource awareness of what these different ICO projects, protocols, et cetera, were doing. So all, all the critical information that you really need. Um, we have a project called DeFi Score uh, that is, it's an open source project. It's crowdsourcing um, all the different criteria that we should be paying attention to for, for all these different protocols. So um, that work is already underway. So. To your question, the most surprising thing that I expect to see in the next 20 years? No, this year. Until oh, the this, end of oh, this year. Oh, until the end of 2020. Um, so I don't know that I would be surprised by it, but I, I think this year um, we'll see definitively uh, that enterprises and perhaps even governments um, find value in public mainnet blockchain systems and will start to very actively use them. Is that, are, are you sensing that from conversations that you're having? Like, I'm curious how the conversation has changed in the last two or three years with governments and, and, and enterprise and this sort of thing. Um, so as I said uh, near the start of the podcast, um, we haven't seen enterprise slow down at all. Uh, through all of the, uh, the crypto winter, which applied to uh, speculators, um, you know, buying and selling tokens on public mainnet. Um, enterprise has continued to take a, a studied approach to the technology. And so we, we've been working with um, major financial institutions, major consumer product institutions, uh, energy companies, um, building out consortia. Um, the, the Comgo Trade Finance uh, consortium network that we built has major financial institutions and energy companies in it, and it's seen over a billion dollars worth of transactions. Uh, and so the ability to digitize, uh, which doesn't require blockchain, but um, blockchain is a trigger uh, for many businesses and industries to, to engage in digit digitization, the ability to cooperate on, in a trustful context with those um, that you compete with or, or you know, value chains. Um, that That's a, a massive breakthrough in, in how businesses can architect themselves. So um, the first thing they're doing is experimenting in context that they can have good control over. Uh, and so we're now seeing systems built where um, error reduction, um, where double keying, uh, where reconciliation, all those things just go away. Uh, because everybody's sitting on this single shared source of truth. They're sitting on basically the same database system. Whole industries can make use of the same database system. They can trust each other because they're writing protocols that, that effectively um, can find uh, and facilitate their behavior. And so, yes, and we're, we're talking with lots of enterprises. We're building with lots of enterprises. Um, and it, it's interesting that, uh, you know, Thank you, Facebook. You did something really wonderful <laughs> for once. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Facebook's always thinking about the benefit of, of humanity. 
Um, and so they introduced this Libra project uh, just to wake central banks up, basically, to, to wake um, uh, commercial banks up, to wake, wake up uh, um, people who are interested in uh, building alternative money systems and alternative payment systems. And so I like the structure of Libra. I don't like, um, wouldn't like it if Facebook was driving Libra still because it would have implications for monetary policy for small and medium-sized nations. But uh, um, lots of different projects like Libra um, are very exciting in providing choice. And essentially, the, the world is waking up just as the world woke up to the internet and web technologies, uh, enterprise and government world. <laughs> so l let's look ahead now. There are, there are, there are several things upon us. Uh, one, one of the big things that's happening in Ethereum is the shift to Ethereum 2.0. It's been talked about for some time now. Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what you think are the biggest challenges uh, ahead for the ecosystem with regards to rolling out E2.0. So it could be on sort of any level of, uh, you know, from technical challenges to regulatory challenges to sort of community governance challenges. Um, give us your thoughts on where Ethereum Yeah, so going. Ethereum 2.0 is going extremely well. Um, consensus has... The, the team shift around, but we got at least six teams uh, working on different aspects of of the development of the protocol, um, research, and, and rolling out uh, of Ethereum two. I I like to think about it in terms of um, evolution of platforms. Um, so evolution of the x eighty six architecture, evolution of the Mac operating system. Uh, it's very similar. Um, both of them, actually, they're they're interestingly different. Um, the x86 architecture had to maintain rigorous compatibility from generation to generation, and I, I think uh, that slows the evolution. It slows um, for, for our listeners. You're talking about uh, sort of the evolution of computing, yeah. the, the the sort of 386 the processors, 90s, 486 yeah. processors. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. And so, um, and so, you because you had to keep all this structure around, um, you couldn't totally re-architect the system. Um, the Mac operating system evolved differently. Uh, so when, when it moved from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS 10, um, it was basically the next computer system reverse taking over the Apple company. Uh, and we went from this single-threaded uh, operating system to this Unix-based uh, you know, yeah. mar marvel of technology. Um, and what they were able to do was... Um, enable people who wrote Mac OS 9 programs to just run those programs in emulation on Mac OS 10. And if you wanted to upgrade your program, yeah. uh, you could start using the, these other libraries and I move to multi-threaded, yeah. multi multi et cetera. And so that's, that is what Ethereum is doing. Universal so, apps, I think, is what they were called. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. So, <laughs> so you could have both code bases inside. That is e exactly what the Ethereum ecosystem is doing. It is starting fresh, designing an an optimized, awesome Ethereum 2, um, and it will enable uh, Ethereum 1 applications to continue to operate. If Ethereum 1 applications want to make use of new features, they'll, then they'll be able to upgrade. Um, the really interesting thing about all of that is that, while these are separate systems, Ethereum 1 and Ethereum 2, um, there will be a smooth progression from Ethereum 1 to Ethereum 2, and Ethereum 1 enables Ethereum 2. So there will be all these bridges built. So first, we're going to see staking um, that enables on Ethereum 1 that enables the beacon chain, the heartbeat of Ethereum 2, to be stood up. So that that's almost certainly, or that's very likely to get landed in the first half uh, of this year. So beacon chain, there are three major phases, phase 0, 1, and 2. Beacon chain is phase 0. That happens um, within a, a small number of months, enabled by Ethereum 1. Once that happens, uh, we can see two things. We can see bridges um, back to Ethereum 1, enabling Ether to move back and forth. But we can also see um, blocks on Ethereum 2, finalized blocks on Ethereum 1, making Ethereum 1 much more secure and therefore enabling the uh, issuance of Ether to be reduced. The next phase in Ethereum 2 is 
uh, adding 64 data shards. So massive uh, increase in the amount of available data on blockchain. The first good user of Ethereum 2 data shards is Ethereum 1 smart contracts. And so we're seeing all these layer 2 solutions, optimistic rollups, zero knowledge rollups, um, that need a ton of data. And so they're going to be able, essentially smart contracts on Ethereum 1 are going to be able to access massive amounts of data on Ethereum 2. The next phase is execution environments. So we've got uh, uh, the Quilt team within Consensus that uh, are already building execution environments, and we've got specs for phase one and specs for phase two. So all three major protocols have well um, matured specs. Um, we're going to build several different kinds of execution environments, and we will see um, it won't launch for real in 2020, but we'll see developers will uh, understand different ways of programming for Ethereum 2 before the end of this year. And so we'll release some execution environments. When all of that is landed uh, sometime, at, sometime next year, Ethereum 1 essentially becomes an execution environment on Ethereum 2. And so um, it will uh, effectively be, you know, there'll, there'll be a, a checkpoint in time and it, it will be able to migrate into the Ethereum 2 context. Um, at that point, it's likely to be able to use lots of different data shards, but probably all of its state will sit on one data shard of Ethereum 2. And so uh, smooth transition, um, we will work to make sure that developers, um, as Apple Computer did, uh, developers have a, a smooth upgrade experience. Um, you know, technology. That's an interesting technology. Analogy. Companies like have been, you know, paying attention to developer experience for a long time, and we're not going to do dumb things like break composability. I think we can wrap it up there. I think we're not going to do dumb things like break composability. <laughs> <Yeah>. my, my. <laughs>